Okay, thanks Orestes. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, I haven't been back to Edinburgh for a number of years now, so it's always a great pleasure to come to this city. And uh, I know a few faces in the audience, but not many, so it's a, it's a pleasure to meet new people. So let me tell you what I want to talk about. Um, this is an epistemology talk. Um, but it's uh, a talk about the epistemology of logic. Now, the word logic means many things. It's highly ambiguous. Um, compare it with the word dynamics. So we talk about the dynamics of the earth, which, by which we mean the way the earth moves. But we also talk about Newtonian dynamics, which is a theory of how things move. Okay? So the word dynamics is ambiguous. It can be a theory or it can be the stuff itself. Well, the word logic is similarly ambiguous. It can mean what really follows from what, or it can mean a theory of what follows from what. And I'm concerned with logic in the sense in which it's a theory, okay? So if you look at the history of Western logic in the last two and a half thousand years, there have been many different theories of what follows from what. I'm not gonna go into history now, we can talk about that if you want to, but there have been many theories in the last two and a half thousand years um, and it's pretty clear that they disagree with each other on many issues. So we have a multiplicity of theories. And if you have a multiplicity of theories, then there's obviously a question of uh, how you decide which is the best one, which is the rationally preferable one. And uh, I guess the answer is not obvious. Okay, that's what I want to talk about. Now, um, Elsewhere, I have proposed a method for rational evaluation of theories in general and logical theories in particular. Uh, and what I want to do today is apply that in a case study so you can see how it works. Okay, so what the essence of today's talk is, is um, showing you how to apply a sort of simple model of theory choice to a particular example of theory choice in logic. Now, uh, the, where we're going is this. Uh, this is the... This is... It's a screen. Hmm? I think it doesn't work with the screen. Ah, oh, okay. It works on the... It works, but it's not on the screen. It's picking up from the receiver at the bottom of the laptop, the computer. Oh, so... so okay, so... Oh, I'll... All right, so I can point, okay? So um, this is really where I do the case study, okay? But um, I can't expect you to understand the case study unless you understand the case. Okay, so the first half of the talk are preliminaries. So uh, it, in the preliminaries, first of all, I'll explain how the model of theory choice works. Then I'll talk about the particular case study that I want to apply it to. And then when we've got to that, then we can see how to apply the model to the case study. Now, um, this bit is necessary, otherwise you won't understand this bit. But the fact that I could do this first means that this is a somewhat longer talk than I would like to give. Um, so apologies for that. Uh, but what I would think I'll do is break at particular points to see if you've got any questions so that I don't talk for an hour without a break, which is not good news. All right, so that, that's where we're going, okay? Very, very uh, I have to say that Graham has asked me whether we can extend a little bit the, the session, right? So the time is to end a little bit after the five minutes. Okay. Perhaps even 5.30, depending on how the session is. So that was a kind of pre-introduction, all right? So let's, let's go for the introduction. Um, I'll give you the model of theory choice in a moment, but let me tell you a little bit first of all about the case study, and it concerns counterfactuals. Um, now, uh, have a look at these counterfactuals. Uh, if intuition log intuitionist logic were collect correct, then explosion will be valid. So explosion is the principle of inference that contradictions imply everything. So from A and its negation, you can infer B. Which is, of course, valid in classical logic, but it's also valid in intuitionistic logic. So if intuitionist logic were correct, explosion would be valid. Um, that seems true. But let's now say if intuitionistic logic were correct, explosion would not be valid. 
Well, that seems false, right? Because explosion is valid in intuitionist logic. Um, or if Hobbes had squared the circle, all the sick children in the Andes would have been interested. Well, okay. The antecedent is logically impossible, right? Uh, because you can't square the circle. Um, but that doesn't look very like, like a very plausible conditional, right? Because the sick children in the Andes wouldn't have known, let alone cared. Okay. So, assuming that intuitionist logic is not correct, these conditionals are both, uh, um, well, they both have necessarily false antecedents. Now, there is a dispute currently going on in logic about whether or not uh, counterfactuals with necessarily false antecedents must be true. Some people, like Tim Williamson, think that they are vacuously true. So a vacuist is someone who thinks that counterfactuals with impossible antecedents are true, vacuously true. Whereas a non-vacuist is someone who thinks that some are true, some are false. So this is a debate that's currently going on about counterfactuals, and this is the debate that I want to focus in on in the... Uh, as an application for the theory of for the method of theory choice, um, the um, uh, there are proponents on both sides of the debate. The um, the main proponents at the moment on the uh, vacuous side are Tim Williamson uh, in these books of his. Uh, the uh, main proponents of uh, the uh, well, uh, some main proponents of non vacuism uh, are these guys. I guess I'm one of them. Um, so you can see which side of the debate I'm going to come down on. Okay, that's not a surprise. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you some arguments for it. However, that, that's not the main point of today's talk. The main point really is to show how you can apply the model of theory choice, which uh, I'm going to give you, to this dispute. Hopefully, so you can see how to make sense of it. Okay, so make sense of you know some of the arguments that used pro and contra. All right, so. Um, that's the real introduction. Now let's move to the preliminaries, and I need to tell you um, what the model of theory choice is, which I'm going to apply. Now, um, I think the model of rational theory choice is pretty much the same whenever you theorize about. So we theorize all the time in uh, science, in metaphysics, in ethics, in aesthetics, and in logic. Um, and um, how you sort of cash out the exact details of theory choice may depend. For example, um, accuracy, numerical accuracy to the data is pretty important in science. It's not so clear that numerical accuracy is, is, is works in logic because we don't have really many numbers. Um, so the, how exactly how you implement the theory uh, may change depending on the area in which you're theorizing. However, I think the method itself is pretty general. Okay? So, when we theorize, um, in the first place, well, what are theories for? In the first place, theories are there to explain something, a certain kind of data. So, you might have Empirical data you want to explain, you might have moral data you want to explain, um, or you might have logical data you want to explain. So, um, okay, you're in Rome, if you're in Rome, you're in Italy, so you're in Italy. That looks pretty good, right? You're in Italy, if you're in Italy, then you're in Rome, so you're in Rome, not so good. Okay, so we have all kinds of uh, data about what sorts of inferences are valid and what sorts of inferences are invalid. Now, the data is soft. Theorization is always dealing with data which is soft. So, uh, you know, data can be overturned with, if you have a good reason. But generally speaking, we have all this fallible data that we want to theorize. So a theory of validity must account for which inferences are good, which inferences are bad, and why. Uh, and we want it to do a good job of explaining the data that we have. So far, so good. But, of course, it's very rare that any theory will explain all the data. 
And I suppose just occasionally it could be the case that two different theories explain all the data equally well. So adequacy to the data cannot be the sole criterion of theory choice. Okay, And uh, those of you who work in the philosophy of science will know that there's a bunch of other criteria which we deploy in rational theory choice. So um, just for the sake of today, uh, the criteria we're going to consider are adequacy to the data, and then consistency, simplicity, power, unifying power, and so on. So uh, when we evaluate a theory, uh, even though adequacy to the data is the most important of the criteria, we have to take the others into account as well. And it's not difficult to see that the criteria may well pull in different directions in different theories. So, for example, standard bit of history, or at least you know the Baudelaire version of it, um, if you look at um, early Copernican astronomy, and uh, Ptolemaic astronomy, they were pretty much equally good in the adequacy of the data. Right? They both did pretty good jobs. Um, but uh, Copernican astronomy was simpler, uh, not because it didn't use epicycles, it did, because it didn't use the equant. Okay. The equant is when you decenter the center of rotation. It's no longer the center of the circle. So it's generally regarded that um, in terms of simplicity, Copernican theory was better, all right, but um, it was sadly lacking in unifying power because the standard theory of the day in the early 16th century was Aristotelian and you couldn't explain why the earth moved. It just didn't make sense in Aristotelian um, uh, dynamics. So uh, Ptolemaic astronomy, which said that the earth is stationary, fitted much better with uh, uh, the current dynamics of the day. So simplicity pulled in one direction um, and unifying power pulled in the other. So, you know, the, the criteria can pull in different directions. All right. So uh, given that, how do you determine which is the best theory overall? Well, um, what you're looking for is the one that does best kind of all things considered. Now, I know that's vague, okay? Uh, let me try to make it a little more precise. Let me give you a sort of a time model of how this works. Um, so I want to make the thought that I just explained uh, a bit more accurate by giving you a formal model of theory choice. So um, we've got a... I wonder if mine works. So I think it's because it gains the screen. Yeah, you're right. All right. So we, we've got a number of criteria, C1 through Cn, and uh, we want to evaluate how well a theory operates according to each of those criteria. So um, we need some kind of measuring scale, and this is kind of arbitrary, it's conventional, but just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that it's some integer between plus and minus 10. So plus 10 is best, minus 10 is worst. And you need a measure function which measures how well a theory, T, behaves on each of the criteria. So it's going to map, uh, if you've got a, a criteria in C, mu C is going to map the theory to something in that scale. And... Um, not all criteria are equally important, okay? I've already said that adequacy to the data is going to be the most important one, but you might think that um, power is more important than simplicity, maybe not, but anyway, uh, not all criteria are equally good, so we need to assign a weight to each criterion, and we might as well take that to be measured on the same scale. Okay. So uh, that's a little bit of basic technical apparatus. And with that, you can define the rationality index of a theory. So the rationality index of a theory is just the weighted sum of how well the theory performs on those criteria. So you just uh, uh, measure uh, the theory on each of the criteria. You then multiply the sum with the criteria appropriately weighted. And when is a theory rationally preferable? Well, um, 
if you've got a bunch of theories from which you have to choose, then you, the, the rational choice is the one with the highest rationality index. Um, if you've got two equal, equally top contenders, well, we can argue about what you do. Maybe you can choose at random. Maybe uh, you, you can go either way rationally. doesn't really matter. Um, but computing the rationality index of uh, something is a way you determine which theory is rationally preferable. Now, I mean, I'm not suggesting that when scientists or theoreticians actually try to figure out which theory is rationally best, they do this. Okay, I think they probably do it inchoately. Um, uh, but uh, I think something like this is the kind of inchoate procedure that goes on when theorists choose which theory they find rationally preferable. All right. Um, so that's the first half of the prepar preparatory material. It's the theory, uh, a sort of formal theory of theory choice. So let me pause for a second and see whether you want to ask any questions about this. Um, yeah. Um, can you say something about why you've chosen uh, negative 10 and positive 10 instead of the interval from 0 to 1? It doesn't make any difference. So it won't make a difference that 0 no. times anything is going to... No. Oh, hang on. Uh, actually, you're right. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you, you, uh, it's fine to have a zero point in your scale, but you want it to be the point of indifference. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Okay, any other questions? Okay. We haven't heard about the weights yet. Well, um, I, in, in, in general, you know, this is, this is an abstract model. Uh, we will come back to a closer look at the weights in, in, in the context of the application. But this is just to try to show you that you know, the sort of waffle about choosing the overall best theory can at least be made um, uh, technically uh, kind of uh, rigorous if it is with a kind of simplistic model. I mean, you can complicate this in various ways, but this is fine to give you the idea. All right, so any other questions before we move on to the next bit of the preliminaries? All right. So that is the model of rational theory choice, which I want to illustrate. Now, I need to uh, show you the two theories of uh, counterfactuals to which I'm going to apply this model. Uh, I guess not everyone in the room is a logician, right? Okay. Uh, um, who's done some modal logic? Okay, all right. Um, so... Actually, Grant, can I just ask a question? Mm, sure. Um, what's the difference between power and adequacy for the data? Because I guess I would have thought that they were more or less the same. All right, uh, fair enough question. Uh, roughly speaking, power means you can explain more of the data. Um, uh, let, 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 I'll come back and we, we'll look at a particular example of the difference when we get to the case study, okay? Uh, but I should say that you know, all, all these criteria are kind of a bit vague. Sometimes they bleed into each other. Um, and exactly what each one means is, of course, contentious. It's sort of philosopher's science thing that philosopher's science talk about. However, um, uh, Let's come back and talk about the particular case study if you want to, all right? All right. So now I want to give you two theories. And the theories are couched in terms of the semantics of a modal logic. Um, and uh, the theory of counterfactuals, uh, uh, the orthodox theory of counterfactuals is vacuist. Uh, some of you may know this. Um, but the theories that logicians give are uh, couched in terms of the semantics of a formal language. So to explain the two theories, uh, let's start with the vacuous theory um, and uh, give you the semantics, the vacuous semantics, vacuist semantics. All right, so we've got a bunch of connectives. They're the usual suspects. This guy here is uh, the counterfactual conditional. The others are modal 
perorators and conjunction, etc. Okay, so this is a propositional language. We've got a pro set of propositional parameters, which I'll call pi, and a set of formulas, which I'll call phi. Not terribly exciting. Okay, what does an interpretation for that language look like? So this is a way we assign truth values to statements in an interpretation in such a way as to define validity, okay? Which is what we're after, a theory of validity. What follows from what? Um, so we've got P, which is a set of possible worlds. Possible worlds, note. Um, and uh, there are different semantics for counterfactuals, but this one is probably the most simple. Okay? Uh, and how it works is that for each formula, you've got an accessibility relation. So if you're doing standard modal logic, there's only one accessibility relation. It goes with the modal operators, right? But in counterfactual logic, you have uh, an accessibility relation for each formula. Okay. So for every formula A, RA is a binary relation on P. Uh, now, how do you understand the meaning of the accessibility relation in this context? Well, W1 RA W2 means that world 2 is a world which is Keteris Paribus, the same as W1, except that A is true. So intuitively, how do you evaluate a counterfactual? Well, you go to those worlds, which are Ceteris Paribus, that are the same as ours, except the antecedent is true. And you see if the consequent holds there. All right? So the accessibility relation is taking you from a world to a world which is Ceteris Paribus the same, except that the antecedent holds there. All right. Um, and then we assign a truth value at every world to every propositional parameter. So every propositional parameter is either true or false at each world. Okay, so now we need to define what it means to hold at a world. And these are the standard truth conditions. So a parameter P is true at a world just if the interpretation gives it the value 1. I'm going to stop doing that. Okay, not A is true, just if it's not the case that A is true. A conjunction is true if both conjuncts are. A disjunction is true if one or other disjunct is. Box A is true just if at every possible world A is true. So if you know about semantics of mode logic, this is S5, okay? Um, diamond A is true if at some possible world A is true, and this is the counterfactual conditional. Uh, if A then B is true at a world, just if for every world you can access along the accessibility relation for A, B is true there. So as I said, what does it mean to evaluate counterfactual? Well, just go to those worlds which are Keteris Paribus, the same as ours, except the antecedent is true there. See if the conclusion is true there. All right. So those are the truth conditions for the, this propositional language, which contains a counterfactual operator. Uh, and the definition is a validity is a standard one. Uh, an inference is valid if it's truth-preserving at every possible world of every interpretation. So uh, if you've got a bunch of premises, sigma, and a conclusion A, A follows from sigma just if in every interpretation and every world in the interpretation, uh, if every premise is true at the world, then the conclusion is true at the world. Okay, so that's a very basic theory of counterfactuals. Um, you may have seen something similar before with uh, similarity spheres. This is much simpler and much more basic. Um, in fact, it's so basic that we've put, I've put absolutely no constraints on the accessibility relation. So in terms of modal logic, this is kind of the analog of K where you have an accessibility relation on the modal operators with no constraints. But the very meaning of the accessibility relation tends to motivate certain constraints. Uh, this is one of them. If uh, W prime 
Okay, if w r a w prime, then w prime makes a true. Because what does it mean? Okay, r a takes you to a world which is Keteris parabolic the same, except a is true there. So you know you expect that. And in all these semantics, if you add constraints on the accessibility relation, you validate inferences that weren't valid before. And so uh, this one constrains. Uh, this one validates uh, the identity conditional. What about this? Uh, if A is true at a world, then uh, W, then W accesses itself along A. Okay? So if A is true at this world, then this world is one of the worlds which is Keteris Parabos, the same as this world, except that A is true. Okay. Uh, what does that validate? Well, that validates our old friend Modus Ponens. So we could argue about what other constraints you might want to put on the accessibility relation. Um, but this is all we need for the moment. Okay? And the important thing is this. <coughs> Vacuism follows. Right? If A is impossible, then any conditional if A then B is true. Vacuously. Because when you evaluate this, you go to all the worlds where A is true, um, along the accessibility relation, and B has got to be true there. Well, if there's no possible worlds in which A is true, vacuously, that's going to be satisfied. Every world you can get to where A is true, B is true, because you can't get to any worlds where A is true, because it's impossible. Okay. So this is vacuism, and it's a kind of feature of the kind of semantics that uh, Tim Williamson likes. It's kind of standard in Lewis Stolnacker, counterfactuals, and so on. All right. Now, there was some heavy-duty logic... Well, some medium duty logic going on there. Let me pause because uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'll try not to lose too many people too fast. Any questions? Yes? Within the constraints, mm. is it, do interpretations fix the exact ex uh, extension of RA, or will all interpretations have the same? Oh, okay. So in every interpretation, the same family of constraints is put on RA. So if you just think about modal logic again, and if you take um, the modal logic, say, T, you insist that in every, access, uh, in every interpretation, the uh, accessibility relation is reflexive. So you constrain the whole class of models by the appropriate constraints. Okay. But there could be two. Uh, but as long as you're satisfying those constraints... One interpretation could have one accessibility relation. Oh, absolutely. A Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, in the interpretation, the accessibility relation is any binary relation on the worlds, provided it satisfies those constraints, okay. as, as in modal logic. Okay, any other logic -y questions? Okay, this is the hardest bit of logic. There's a little bit more, but if you come this far with me, the rest is reasonably straightforward. So let me ask again. Do you want me to explain anything that we've just done? All right. So that's the vacuous theory, right? Now let me tell you about the non-vacuous theory. And essentially it's going to be the same except for one thing. Um, we're interested in evaluating counterfactuals with impossible antecedents. Now, if you stick to possible worlds, there are no worlds where the impossible antecedent can be true. That's what gives you vacuism. So what do you do? Well, you add impossible worlds. Okay? So that when you evaluate a conditional with an impossible antecedent, it can take you to an impossible world. Easy, right? Yes, it is, almost that easy. Okay, so semantics for non-vacuism is going to be exactly the same, except that we add a set of impossible worlds. Okay, so um, we now need to say how to evaluate things at impossible worlds. We don't, we're not going to figure out with truth at possible worlds. That remains the same. Okay? So what I gave you were a set of recursive truth conditions for truth at a possible worlds. Now, what happens at impossible worlds? Well, you know, all bets are off. 
anything can happen in the possible world. I mean, there can be kind of mildly anarchic, middlingly anarchic, or completely anarchic. All right? So we're going to accommodate the most possible, most anarchic kind of possible world. Um, what that means is that anything can happen in an impossible world. You can assign any formula, true or false, at any impossible world. So for every formula A and any impossible world, this interpretation function assigns either 1 or 0 to A at that world. So this allows for the world to be as anarchic as you wish. You can make anything true and anything false. Okay, but notice that the accessibility relation must now be a binary relation on uh, the totality of all worlds, possible and impossible. Because, you know, if we're evaluating a counterfactual with an impossible antecedent, we really want it to take us to an impossible world. So the accessibility relation has to be able to access, access impossible worlds as well. However, even though the accessibility relation can access impossible worlds, notice that validity is defined in terms of truth preservation at possible worlds. If you define it as truth preservation over all worlds, then you know you get nothing because impossible worlds are entirely anarchic. Okay, but then if we're looking at what follows from what, why why care about what happens if you know the logically impossible happens? We're interested in what happens when you know we're dealing with uh, the true logic, the worlds where the true logic holds, and these are presumably the possible ones. So validity is still defined in the same way, namely truth preservation over all possible worlds. So the impossible worlds really can only, only come into their own when you're evaluating counterfactuals. Uh, and, well, let's just think for one more moment about the kinds of constraints that you want to put on the accessibility relation. Presumably, you want to put the same ones as before, right? And the rationale is exactly the same. But here's another one, okay, which is kind of plausible. What it says is, okay, um, if at some possible world A is true, and if W is a possible world, then uh, at W, Ooh. Um, from RA uh, and you get to W prime, W prime is itself possible. So let's just think a bit about what that means for a moment. Um, when do you expect to get kicked out in an impossible world? Well, just if you're uh, uh, dealing with an impossible antecedent. But if you're at a possible world, and the antecedent is possible, you shouldn't expect to get kicked out from impossible worlds. The worlds that are categorized parallels the same as a possible world, except that a possible antecedent holds, you'd expect to be possible as well, right? So this is a, a very natural constraint, and it'll play some role in what follows. Uh, and you may say, well, okay, uh, what, what inference does that, what sort of inference does that relate? Well, here's one of them. Uh, namely, if A is possible, and if A then B, then B is possible, okay? Because uh, if you're at a possible world, and if A then B is true, and A is possible, then uh, B has got to be possible, and that's what this says. And that's given to you by this constraint, which uh, I don't think I gave it a name on the screen. IP stands for the integrity of the possible. In other words, you don't get kicked out to an impossible world unless something forces you to. All right, so that's the impossibilist, the non-vacuous semantics, and uh, it's not difficult to show that this inference is now invalid. Okay. Uh, uh, if you're at a possible world and the antecedent is 
impossible, then evaluating the conditional can take you to an impossible world, and you can have P true there and Q false, simply by the behavior of uh, impossible worlds. So this is how the trick is turned. Uh, this is how you break the vacuous conditionals once you have impossible worlds to deal with. All right. So let me pause again. Um, any questions about either the vacuous semantics or the non-vacuous semantics? Because I'm going to be appealing to sort of various properties of these semantics. Yeah. So on the non-vacuous semantics, all the counter, counter possible, so then it's in false. Is that right? Because when, when you go to an impossible world, I mean, if, if the truth conditions are the same, true, they're all impossible worlds. So anything can happen in these impossible worlds. You're going to get that the consequence will be true with some and false and so on. Um, let, let me come back to that. Okay. Uh, you're raising an interesting point, uh, which can, will concern the dialectic of the discussion between the two theories. Yeah, because I was just going to say, like, if you're unhappy with the vacuous truth, mm. I'm wondering if, if you're now you're just going to get, because of the makeup of the theory, you're going to get all the false and all the Okay. Um, the, the quick answer, and we'll look at it a bit more detail in a moment, is if you didn't have this constraint, the integrity of the possible, the theory will be enormously weak, okay? But it's having the constraint of the integrity of the impossible, which means you, that it isn't weak in a certain sense, which I'll come back to, okay? okay. So that this constraint IP really is very important. Okay. Yeah? Sorry, it's the last one. Sure, sure. What was the, what was the set pi? Was that the set of... Propositional pi parameters. parameters. Yeah, okay, pi for parameter, right? Phi for formula. So where do you want me to go to? So phi, sorry, phi is the top? No, no, phi for formula. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, pi for parameter, phi for formula. Right. But, the, but then, yeah, the valuation function taking any formula as argument, I thought, maybe I just got lost in the notation. But, uh, okay, this is a... The V sub W, yep. that's how you're using that. So, so V sub W yeah. is something that assigns a truth value to something at worlds. Okay. okay? And uh, in the vacuous semantics, it assigns truth to propositional parameters at possible worlds. Okay? It still does that in the non-vacuous semantics, but it has an extra function. Namely, at impossible worlds, it assigns every formula a value. Okay? So the, the domain has expanded now. Well, the domain of worlds has the domain of worlds has expanded. Okay. okay. So you know how to evaluate formulas at possible worlds. That's the same. What you didn't know before was how you evaluate um, the, the truth or falsity of formulas at um, impossible worlds. And the answer is kind of boring, right? You just assign it a truth value. Um, this is a standard technique that is used in the semantics of non-normal modal logics. So, I mean, I didn't invent this. It's kind of standard fare in non normal modal logics. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, I, I first thought pi, I first thought pi was the atomic formula. And okay. I was confused. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's just the same as before, but I see now. Okay, so we're good? Yeah. Good, good. Good. Yes? I got the last one, the truth conditions for the condition. Right. Uh, could you uh, go back to that? Go back to that, yeah, because I, was, I wasn't sure whether the, it looked like the non vacuous case was going to need a special definition. Uh, yeah, so for all W prime, for all the accessible yeah. so, so how is it that on the non-vacuous case, the conditionals don't wind up vacuously false? Because the accessibility relation can take you to an impossible world. Right. Okay, so just, just think for a second. Um, if you've got counterfactuals at impossible worlds, they're assigned a truth value ad lib. Um, what about the uh, truth value of counterfactuals at possible worlds? Well, you apply this condition. Um, so you go to all the worlds that are accessible along the accessibility relation and see whether the consequent is true there. But um, okay, uh, now the accessibility relation is a subset. Not is, is, it's. Um, a relation not just on pairs of worlds, pairs of possible worlds, it's um, 
uh, a binary relation on all, all the pairs of all worlds. Okay. So even at a possible world, when you travel along the accessibility relation, it can take you to an impossible world. Okay? Since anything goes to an impossible world, with any impossible antecedent, can't you follow accessibility to a world where the consequence is false? Uh, yes, so we're coming back to the question that was asked just now. Okay, um, It looks as though the theory of counterfactuals you're going to get is very, very weak. Um, and it is in a certain sense. Let, let, let me shove this question so we deal with it in detail. Okay, If you're not satisfied, then, then please feel free to bring it up again. Okay. All right, any other technical questions? This one? Um, the, the definition of uh, non vacuism is what you have reached before. Not, no, go forward to where you find that one? That one. Yes. Saying P is not possible, then, then no counterfactuals hold. No, it, it's saying that the inference from the impossibility of P to the truth of the conditional is not valid. Right. Okay. So it doesn't tell you it's false. No. It just tells you this inference is not valid. Do not conclude impossible. Yeah. So, okay. So here's a, a diagram, okay? So these are the worlds. Here are the possible worlds, and here are the impossible worlds. So validity is defined as truth reservation over all possible worlds. Let's take a possible world, okay? Um, now let's uh, take uh, some uh, for some p, which is impossible. All right. So we know that p does not hold at any possible world. Okay. So let's evaluate if p then q. Well, it's got to take us. When we go along the R, RP, it's got to take us to a world where P holds. So it can't be possible. So it's got to take us out here. All right. And for the thing to be valid, then every world you get to where P is true, Q is true. And that may not be true because we can just assign P the value 1 and Q the value 0. Okay. So that, that's why this inference is invalid, okay? But of course, you know, particular counterfactuals with impossible antecedents can be true in a model. It's just that they don't, the, tr uh, the truth does not follow from the mere impossibility of the antecedent. Got it. Okay, good. It just has to have an accessibility relation that rules out those P1, Q0. It'll do that, yeah. Um, uh, and that, of course, will depend on, in, in real life, that will depend on what P and what Q are. So, I mean, this is just a formal model of, of validity and invalidity. Um, so in real life, of course, there's a connection between the meanings of the P's and the Q's. Uh, you know, if something is red, it's coloured, that's pretty valid, but it doesn't come out as valid in the semantics of first order logic, because you need further constraints which do something for you. All right. Any other technical questions? I'm happy to spend time on this. Because um, you know, if this stuff is not clear, so I have another question. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. I just don't understand, like, how from the semantics for the counterfactual. I mean, it seems like you have to stipulate something about what the accessibility relation does. Because, well, I must be misunderstanding, right? But the truth condition just says, you know, um, sure. if the let's say sigma is a, right? If the if there's these inaccessible worlds, then you know the consequent has to hold yep. there. But then, if since we're the domain of quantification, the union of the possible and the impossible, mm. presumably they're going to be impossible a worlds. I mean, with the impossible worlds with the antecedents true, mm -hmm. how do we avoid not including them in the domain of quantification? Because suppose we have some quantification. So, well, that, that's a bad way of putting it. Suppose there's some kind of factual that we intuitively think is true. Yes. Right? Uh, and that it has, yeah, so we truly think it's true. Now, for it to be true, it has to be the cases that in all the antecedent accessible worlds, the consequent holds. Mm -hmm. 
But now there are going to be some impossible worlds mm -hmm. where the antecedent is true, mm -hmm. and at some of those, the consequent suppose because everything is possible. That we well, uh, I mean, it depends on the interpretation. Yeah, right. So, so, but then, don't we have to say something about like something more specific about how the accessibility relation, like how it picks the worlds that are accessible in order to avoid certain kind of factors that come out false that we want to come out true? No. Look, here's a possibly. Poss perfectly possible counterfactual. Um, uh, if I jumped out the window, I'd kill myself. That is not a logically, tr uh, tr logically true counterfactual. Okay? But it's true. So if you're giving an interpretation which respects things like that, then you are going to want to say, well, you know, if you've got an accessibility relation which, um, where the antecedent is I jump out the window, it had better take you only to worlds where I kill myself. Okay? So this is a story about logical truth. It's not a story about truth. Ah, I see. Okay. That, okay? That's exactly right. Okay. Good. All right. Any other technical questions? All right. So that was the preliminary stuff, okay? Now, that sounds horrible, because we're now three quarters around the talk. However, that's the longest part of the talk. Now, the rest should be relatively straightforward to follow, okay? So, remember, I've given you uh, a theory of theory choice about the sort of weighted um, sum of the behavior of the theory on uh, the various criteria. And we've now got two theories to apply the theory of theory choice to. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is actually apply the theory of theory choice to choose between those two theories. Um, and you can already guess which one can I come down, but it's the journey that's important, not so much the destination. All right, so um, the hardest criterion is adequacy to the data. Let me leave that till the end, because that's the most complex. Let's deal with the other criteria, all right? Because they're relatively straightforward. So um, one of these was consistency. Both of these theories are consistent. So there's nothing to choose between them, right? We're not playing uh, para-consistent games here. Both theories are consistent. That's easy. Uh, they're both consistent, so there's nothing much to choose between them. Uh, simplicity. Okay, now well, there's a weasel word for you. Simplicity at least comes in two different kinds. There's conceptual simplicity, and there is um, ontological simplicity. So con let, let's deal with conceptual simplicity first. So one theory is more complex than another um, if it has sort of uh, more complexity in its concepts. Now, it's pretty obvious that the impossible world semantics are more complex than the possible world semantics conceptually, just because you've got an extra bunch of concepts, right? But the extra complexity is not really you know, hard. I mean, the, the, the vacuous semantics, it took me three slides to explain. The impossible worlds I covered in half a slide. Okay? So, yep, it's more complicated conceptually, but the extra concepts are not themselves terribly complex. So, okay, uh, the vacuous position is a bit simpler than the non vacuous position, but not that much. Ontological. All right, uh, it looks as though there's more difference here, because after all, both theories have possible worlds. And the non-vacuous theory also has another kind of world, quite, quite different, impossible worlds. So at this moment of time, if you're William Van Ormond Quine, you'd fall off your perch, because uh, you're, you're not only introducing these horrible new, you're not only introducing these new kinds of creatures, they are the kind of revolting creatures. Um, be that as it may, um, uh, you are introducing a second kind so, you know, according to Occam's razor, um, you've got just one kind of world for the vacuist and two kinds of worlds for the non-vacuist. And one is simpler than two. 
Okay, so that's pretty clear. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the set of possible worlds is countable. So no. no. Okay, so um, the, 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 the cardinality of the worlds can be, can be anything, as in standard model theory, right? Okay, right. There's a sense I'm seeing in which the impossible worlds have got to be vastly more numerous than the possible ones because of this ability to just randomly assign truth values to everything. It, it depends on the size of the... Uh, look. In, in modal semantics, or the counterfactual semantics, the cardinality of the set of possible worlds can be as large as you like. Um, and the cardinality of the set of impossible worlds in interpretation can be as big or as small as you like. So there's nothing about the model theory which constrains the size of the worlds. Uh, you can have you know, an interpretation with one world, you can have an interpretation with two to the of naught worlds. That, that's not determined by the model theory. It's arbitrary. All right. So, we're talking about ontological simplicity, and I've pointed out that, you know, we've only got one kind of entity in the possibilist semantics, you've got two in the impossibilist. So, pretty clear that the um, vacuous semantics is simpler. Um, be careful, though. Um, what we're applying here under another name is Occam's razor. Occam's razor says that you shouldn't multiply entities beyond necessity. Not that you shouldn't multiply necessities. So not that you shouldn't multiply entities. Period. You shouldn't multiply entities beyond necessity. And that's kind of weasel phrase, right? Because you want to know what necessity means in this context. So if it turns out that other considerations are pushing you towards invoking impossible worlds, Occam's razor, if not sort of destroyed, is somewhat blunted. However, um, certainly as far as... Um, oh, that's the caveat. Okay, certainly as far as uh, the notions of simplicity goes, the judgment, I think, is pretty clear. The vacuous semantics is... Ooh, how do we get there? Hmm. I think you can probably touch and choose the sections. Oh, is that what it is? Maybe, uh, ah. I also wonder when you go out of it and you double click with your finger, it kind of becomes... Oh. All right. Okay, I'm not going to experiment in the middle of a lecture, right? Um, <laughs> Okay, so the second criterion was simplicity, and um, the judgment is pretty clear. The vacuous semantics is simpler, right? At least somewhat. Okay, um, power. Okay, now this comes back to your point. Um, the, it looks as though, no, it is so, that most of the standard counterfactual logical truths are going to be invalid in the non-vacuous semantics. Even, you know, things like this. If A, if a and B were the case, then A would be the case. Because if, uh, you, I mean, A and B may be an impossible condition, in which case it takes you to an impossible world where A may not be true. There's nothing that says in the impossible world, if a conjunction is true, one of the conjuncts is true. So, um, it looks as though the non-vacuous semantics is very low on power in the sense that it's not going to validate many inferences. Okay, you've got identity, you've got modus ponens, uh, nearly everything else is going to go. So prima facie, it looks as though um, you've moved from a quite powerful logic to a, a very anemic logic. Okay, If that's the case, then of course the vacuous semantics is much more powerful. However, matters are not that simple or not that straightforward. Uh, a number of the issues when look at have replies and counter replies. And this is a case in point where there's a counter reply. Because um, if you add, um, provided you've got this constraint, the integrity of the possible, even though this is not valid, 
if you stick the possibility of the antecedent in as an extra premise, then this is valid. Because if the antecedent is possible, you stay within the dom domain of possible worlds. Okay? So everything behaves as you're used to. And quite generally, if you've got any inference that's valid in the vacuous semantics, it's going to, be turn, it's going to turn out to be valid in the non-vacuous semantics, provided you add the extra premises, the extra premises that the, all the conditionals you're dealing with have possible antecedents. So in other words, I mean, if you think that the vacuous, vac, vacuous semantics is right, then the non-vacuous does not need to disagree with that because the non-vacuous will say, hey, you know, you're only thinking of possible worlds. And if we're just thinking of possible worlds, my theory is exactly the same. So, um, prima facie, it might have seemed that a lot of power is getting lost. But once you look at it, you're not, because the new theory, the impossibilist theory, retains the power of the old theory. Because as long as you stick to possible worlds, the same theory is the same as the old theory. Now, uh, there's a counter-counter reply. I, I might say that I'm taking all these arguments from the papers that I showed you originally. I'm not making them up, okay? Um, the dialectic of the reply counter reply sometimes get a bit, gets a bit complex, but I'm not going to follow every argument down the tortured path. I'm going to keep things as simple as possible to illustrate the points. So, um, okay, so the non vacuous reply is hey, if you've got this constraint IP, you're fine. A counter reply would be, well, okay, IP is ad hoc. Of course, ad hocness is uh, not a good methodological point. Um, reply, not so. Because just think about it, it's actually motivated by the very meaning of the accessibility relation. Right? If you're in a possible world, and if you're dealing with a possible condition, which worlds would you expect to be Keteris Parabos the same as this world, except that that condition holds? Possible ones. If you're in a possible world and you're dealing with an impossible condition, then the things that are Keteris Parabos the same, except that that condition is true, you'd expect to be possible by the very meaning of the accessibility relation. So, reply. Uh, the IP is not ad hoc because it's motivated by the very meaning of the accessibility relation. Okay, so final judgment then, it might have seemed at first that the vacuous semantics was much more powerful because you lose all the inference. But we've also seen that uh, probably once you, you know, look carefully at what's happening, there's nothing much to choose between them in terms of power. All right, so... Um, Final other constraint, unifying power. Um, there's a lot to be said about this, but let me say it very, very briefly. Um, impossible worlds have applications in all kinds of areas where modal semantics with merely possible worlds creak. Okay, so if you use possible worlds, for example, to give a theory of intentional verbs like belief, desire, and so on. If you only got possible worlds, then it's going to turn out that you believe and desire everything that's necessarily true. That's certainly not the case for real people. Or if you want to give a theory of content in terms of worlds, and you've only got possible worlds, then every two necessary truths have the same content, every two necessarily falsehoods have the same content. And that's kind of implausible too. Right? Uh, Fermat's last theorem does not have the same content as the law of the excluded middle. So, um, if the impossible worlds find a very natural application in the semantics of intentional verbs, in the semantics of content, um, and so what a theory of impossible worlds allows you to do is unify these dis disparate 
I almost said desperate, maybe it's that too, but it's certainly disparate areas of uh, semantical inquiry. You know, so counterfactuals, uh, intentional states, uh, content. Okay. Uh, if you've got impossible worlds, you, you unify these areas by one single technique. Okay. Uh, you cannot do the same with, with possible worlds. There are things you can do, but they make matters much, much more complex. So, in terms of unifying power, uh, it's clear that the impossible world semantics are better, just because they're much stronger to do a number of jobs, uh, and so they unify the treatment of counterfactuals, uh, intentionality, and so on. All right, so I haven't dealt with adequacy to the data yet. That's the one other thing that we need to do. But let me just... Um, sort of uh, summarize the state of play. So we haven't talked about adequacy to the data. Um, here are the other criteria. And I've assigned sort of rough weights to these criteria. Now, um, you may disagree uh, with how I've assigned these weights. In the end, nothing much is going to turn on them. But I think most people would agree that you know power unifying power pretty important. Consistency, well, for the sake of today, let's say that's really high. Okay, and um, simplicity, well, you know, simplicity is good, but power is better. So as you can see, at the moment, there's really not much to choose between the two theories. Um, maybe non-vacuism has its nose ahead, but you wouldn't want to sort of hang too much on that. So everything really is going to depend on this final criteria, which, you know, is the most important. After all, you know, the main point of a theory is to account for the data. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to do is talk about this last criterion, which is the most complex of them all. Um, so let's just pause for a second there and see if you've got any questions about this stuff. Do you, do you want to come back about power and unifying power? Okay. Um, okay, so any other questions about this stuff? Hmm. Yeah? Just, uh, why should we think that a, a, a logic that has more theories is better? So this notion mm. of power that doesn't seem to be the results. Yeah, okay, good point. Um, no, you're, de you're dead right. And sometimes excess power can be a bit of a vice. Um, so, for example, um, classical logic with a material conditional is much more powerful than, say, a paraconsistent logic or a relevant logic. Uh, and one of the gripes that relevant logicians have against um, classical logic is precisely that this extra power is vicious. So your, your point is dead right. Um, so um, you have to understand this talk of power in a somewhat more nuanced way. We do reason counter using counterfactuals quite often, um, and the loss of power that you appear to get if you've got impossible worlds was pretty devastating. It seems to get rid of virtually every inference. Okay, uh, so even if you think that some of them you shouldn't want anyway, you've lost the whole bloody lot. Okay, so but I, okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so final section of the talk, um, adequacy to the data. Now, uh, this is the most complex of matters, so I'm going to take it in two parts. Because um, prima facie, this is an open and shut case, right? Um, look, if intuitionist logic is correct, the law of excluded middle is invalid. That's true, because we know excluded middle fails in intuitionistic logic. If intuitionist logic is correct, explosion is invalid. False, because explosion is valid in intuitionistic logic. Um, we don't know yet whether Goldbach's conjecture is true or false, but it's either true or false. Um, and so, uh, one of the claims that you can prove Goldbach's conjecture or you can refute Goldbach's conjecture has got to be logically false. So here are a couple of conditionals and just choose the antecedent which is logically false, either prove or refute, right? If you were to prove or refute Goldbach's conjecture, you would become a famous mathematician. 
for sure. If you were to prove or refute Goldbach's conjecture, I would give you my life savings. Mm. No. Okay. Now look, here are some examples. And some of them are true, some of them are false. This is the kind of data, a part of the data, that a theory of counterfactuals should answer to. And it's fairly clear. They call this data vacuism is seriously wanting. Okay. That's the prima facie case. Now, um, there's a reply. As I pointed out earlier, whenever you theorize, the data is soft. And so a, a possible reply here is, hey, this is your data and it's all wrong. Because really, when you understand what's going on, all these things are true. Of course, if you just say that, it's really ad hoc. However, it's not ad hoc if you can give an independent explanation of your intuitions that these, uh, some of these are false. And that's exactly what Tim Williamson does in one of his papers. So he says, yeah, these are really all true. Now I'll tell you why you get the impression that some of them are false. Well, it's because um, uh, this. So this is Tim Williamson's story. Um, when we evaluate, when we take a counterfactual if A then B to be false, it's because we evaluate its mate. That's true. And then we apply this heuristic, that if this is true, this is false. Now, Tim knows very well that this is only a heuristic. It's not correct, but he thinks it's a plausible heuristic. And he thinks that this is how we get to the conclusion that some of these conditionals are false. Because we evaluate the other one first and then apply this heuristic. Okay, this really does not work. And it does not work for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, it would seem that the batteries run out. Let's see what we can do. Ah, thank you. It had, it was all yeah, right. It had moved the view on me. Yeah, well done. Okay, this Tim Williamson's explanation really won't work because uh, it assumes that we evaluate one of the pair first and get true, and then we evaluate the other one to get false. But there's no reason why we should evaluate either one of these things first. Okay. So come back to, you know, um, uh, if intuition logic is correct, LEM is valid. Um, why should I evaluate that before, if intuition is logic is correct, LEM is not valid? Um, or if intuition is logic is correct, explosion is valid. If intuition logic is correct, explosion is not valid. I mean, according to Tim, both of those are vacuously true. Um, so which one comes out to be appear to be false will depend on which one I value at first. And there's no reason I should go one way or the other. But that's um, not really getting to the heart of the matter. Because uh, maybe on some occasions we do apply Tim's heuristic. But generally speaking, we do not. We evaluate counterfactuals in exactly the same way all the time. So, for example, um, if intuitionist logic is correct, LEM is invalid. How do we evaluate that? Well, we go to those scenarios where intuitionist logic holds. We know what those are like. We know about Kripke semantics. We know about um, uh, all the other semantics for intuitionist logic. And we know that if we go to a world where intuitionist logic holds, then LEM fails there. So we go to the appropriate worlds, and we see that the, the consequent is false. How do we evaluate this guy? Exactly the same way. So we go to those worlds where intuition, intuitionist logic is correct. We know what intuitionist logic is like. We know that at those worlds where intuitionist logic holds, explosion does not fail. So we evaluate um, these two conditionals <coughs> in exactly the same way. We do not apply the heuristic. 
Uh, and in fact, it's, it's really that mode of uh, evaluation of counterfactuals which determines the correct result, provided, of course, that you have got worlds where intuitionistic logic is correct. And I'm assuming, for the purpose of today's talk, that it is not. All right. So um, this is a nice attempt to explain the, why the data is wrong, and I do not think it works. Uh, so uh, the original data, I reckon, stands. All right, that's the first half of the story. Second half of the story is this. Hey, but there's some more data out there. Um, because something you want a theory of counterfactuals to do is explain how it is we get away with certain kinds of counterfactual reason. This comes back to your question. Uh, so uh, another argument by Tim is this. Um, according to non-vacuism, this inference fails. Um, A equals B. If A, then PA. So if A, then PB. So substitutive identicals. Right. Now, I didn't give you the semantics for identity because I didn't want to sort of, you know, hang a millstone around your neck. Uh, but the point is right. If uh, given an appropriate semantics for identity in the uh, non-vacuous case, this is going to be invalid. So, I mean, you can just hear Tim saying now, well, I'm, uh, here's another bit of the data that uh, uh, you can't account for. Um, well, all right, so let's see. Um, there's a reply, there's an obvious reply, and it's, it's pretty, it is pretty obvious if you follow me thus far. Um, okay, so well, here's, here's Tim's example. Sorry, I should have told you this. If the rocket had continued on its course, it would have hit Hesperus. That's a pretty powerful rocket, I guess. Um, uh, Hesperus is phosphorus, so if the rocket had continued on its course, it would have hit phosphorus. Okay, Hesperus is phosphorus, right? Um, it looks like a valid inference, and you know, We've just said that the inference is invalid. But the reply is pretty obvious. Namely, um, assuming you've got the integrity of the possible, then the inference, if you add the extra premise that A is possible, this inference comes out valid. And again, I didn't give you the semantics for identity, so I haven't shown you that, but you can trust me on this. Um, if, you, if you don't go into impossible worlds, identity behaves as you think it ought to. So provided we've got an extra premise which says that A is possible, then this is valid. Okay, so again, uh, a vacuist can explain this inference as just a suppressed premise, namely that uh, it's possible, metaphys uh, metaphysically possible, logically possible, that the rocket had continued on its course. And you can still, you can imagine saying, yeah, well, you know, but you still lose this when the antecedent is impossible, don't you? Yes, you should expect you. Look, here's another example. Um, if Hesperus is not phosphorus, modern physics is mistaken. Hesperus is phosphorus, so if Hesperus is not Hesperus, modern physics is mistaken. No, it's not modern physics that's mistaken, it's modern logic that's mistaken. All right. So you shouldn't expect to get substitutive identicals if you are um, once you are dealing with um, uh, antecedents that are not logically true. Okay. So that's a bit of data that's overturned, but there's more. Okay, this is another argument that Tim uses. Um, a reductio proof in mathematics, for example, the um, argument that there's uh, no largest prime, is sometimes put in terms of an argument which appeals to a couple of counterfactuals. If P were the largest prime, then P factorial plus one would be prime. Uh, why? Because P is the largest prime and this is bigger. Um, if P were the largest prime, P factorial plus one would not be a prime. Why? Because because um, uh, you can't divide it by a, a, a prime uh, at all. Sorry, 
Why is that true? Because you can't divide it by any of the numbers, big or small. Yeah, right. But I can okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, so both these conditionals are true, and if you jiggle around with them, you get a proof that there's no largest prime. Um, both of these things are vacuously true, because P, whatever it is, is not the largest prime. All right. So the argument goes, well, you know, here's a bit of data that the non-vacuous can't account for. Uh, the use of counterfactuals in reductio proofs. And notice that we can't make the same kind of arts here because we are dealing with uh, antecedents which are not logically possible. However, uh, there, there is again a different reply but an obvious reply. First of all, um, often when counterfactuals are used by mathematicians, they're simply a façon de parler. We don't often really use counterfactuals in mathematics. So, um, so the first counterfactual was if p were the largest prime, then p plus one is uh, a prime. Okay, that's really in a math in the context of mathematical proof. That's just like saying suppose p is the largest prime, ping, then ba 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 ba. Okay, it's not a counterfactual. It's just counterfactuals are just a cute way of expressing a supposition plus what follows from that. That's one argument. But I mean. Uh, actually, um, a non-vacuous can account for the truth of those conditionals. So this brings us back to what we were talking about earlier, the difference between logical validity and logical truth and truth. Because um, suppose uh, you go to uh, a world where P is the greatest prime, which is Keteris Parabolus like ours. Um, well, it ain't going to be a possible world, but if it's Keteris Parabolus like ours, then you know the basic facts about multiplication, division, addition, and so on are going to be the same. Um, so if you go to an impossible world where P is the largest prime, but addition, multiplication, and so on do behave, behave the same, then the consequent is going to be true. Because it just follows from... The facts about prime numbers, multiplication, and addition. So, uh, again, this is, um, let me remind you where we are in the dialectic. Um, we're looking at the criterion of adequacy to the data. And I pointed out that prima facie, the non vacuous wins hands down. Um, we've just been considering a couple of potential replies. Namely, that there is other data that the non-vacuous can't handle. Uh, and I've just explained why those replies don't work. All right, so um, the original evaluation along the path of adequacy to the data, I think, stands because the counter-replies don't work. All right, so upshot. So this is the same table as before, except that um, I've put in adequacy to the data, and you know I've, I've put in non-vacuism is strongly preferable along the most important criterion. Now you know you do the weighted sum, and you can see what's going to happen. Um, the rationality index of non-vacuism is higher than the rationality index of vacuism. So conclusion: non-vacuism is the better theory. All right. Um, now. Uh, let me just add a few words by way of conclusion. Um, I've given you an argument that vacuism is better than non-vacuism. And, you know, I stand by that. However, that was not the main point of today's talk. The main point of today's talk was to give you a case study in uh, rational theory choice between different logical theories. So I gave you the theory of theory choice, and then we've seen how to apply it to this case study. So even if you think that you know my argument for non-vacuism is wrong, it's because presumably you take issue with some of my arguments. And that's, that's fine, because you can still see how you apply the model of theory choice. Now, um, as I said earlier, uh, I don't think that when physicists or logicians or whatever 
argue that one theory is better than another. They kind of sit down and they put it in these very uh, decision theoretic terms. You don't see that in papers by logicians or physicists either. Um, but I do think that this is what is informing the kind of arguments they give. So if you read the papers by Tim and by uh, the collective of which I was a part, you will find the arguments that I've been going through. We don't put them in terms of the uh, decision theoretic procedure I gave you, but you will find the arguments. Okay? Now you can see why they're relevant. Okay? Because um, tacitly, you can think of these things as addressing the various criteria that are evolved in the rationality of theory choice. Okay. So, um, what the case study does is at least illustrate the method. But I think it does something more than that because um, there's a second order issue here. You might ask, why accept your theory of theory choice? Fair enough question. Well, one reason is that it explains the data. Okay, what data? Well, the data that you find physicists and logicians arguing or using if you go to the logic journals or the physics journals. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said about that question, but uh, you can see today's talk not only as illustrating the method of theory choice that I suggested, but also as um, speaking in its favour, because it does explain the data of what you see when you look in logic journals or physics journals where these issues are debated. So, apologies uh, for going on so long. Um, I don't like to go on this long. However, the second half of the talk would not have been intelligible about the first. So, thank you for your forbearance, uh, for your forbearance, and uh, that's the end. Thank you. Thank you.